Clark never wrote his own story. All of these deceptions, all of these deceits, the creation of, you know, let's list what he did. He did the commandos, US Rangers, SAS. I think he can take a large credit for creating the CIA because he was the inspiration behind OSS because he met Colonel Wild Bill Donovan. So extraordinary character, extraordinary. And, and there's something there that I think people don't, I'm going to borrow a phrase a friend of mine used, which is military entrepreneur, you know, the creativity of these people which is not something you, you necessarily associate with the British military, particularly the British military in the 1940s, but he was a highly creative individual. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name's Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. Now today I'm speaking with Tom Petch, author of Speed, Aggression, Surprise, The Untold Secret Origins of the SAS. Now some of you may have enjoyed watching the TV show on the BBC, SAS Rogue Heroes, and so you think you know the real story. Well, as I've been discovering, there are many different characters involved in the founding of the iconic regiment. Tom gives a different perspective because he looks at one character in particular, Dudley Clark, a flamboyant and entertaining individual who learned all about guerrilla tactics as a young man and then applied that thinking to the early days of the Second World War. In fact, he gave the commando units of the British Army their name, having been influenced by the Boer commandos of the Anglo-Boer War. Tom is also a filmmaker and wrote, produced and directed The Patrol, which is a fantastic film set in Afghanistan, and following a small group of officers and men as they deal with a highly stressful situation. So we talk a little bit about that. Now Tom served in the SAS, so he knows a thing or two about this kind of thing. And whilst he sadly couldn't reveal too much about his time with the unit, his book on its development is fascinating and lots of fun, with many stories that I wasn't even aware of. There is even a character who my own grandfather had a few problems with. Coming up, I've got John Sayles on 18th century Scotland and America, Miranda Mallins and Paul Lay chat all about the 17th century, and I'm also planning on a special on the Parthenon marbles, of which there's been lots of news in the past few months. Please do subscribe so as not to miss any upcoming episodes, and rate and review if you can. There are notes and links in the show notes, but in the meantime, I'll hand you over to Tom Petch, talking about the untold secret origins of the SAS. Tom Petch, welcome to the, the podcast. It's a, a real pleasure to have you on. And we're here to talk about your new book, Speed, Aggression, Surprise. Is it is it SAS Speed, Aggression, Surprise or Speed, Aggression, no, no, Surprise? No, no. That, that, that is actually just a very good title because it abbreviates to SAS. Of course, SAS is the special air service, as we, as we know, but I thought it was a really good title. I can't actually take credit for the card title. I have to confess my agent came up with that. He's a very talented man. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's a good. Well, that's time. what they're for. That's what they're for. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Well, um, I mean, it's interesting because you are a uh, a veteran of the SAS as well, aren't you? Yes, I was a badged member, troop commander of the SAS a long time ago. So my military career ended in ninety seven. So I joined the military as a um a cavalry officer, which is tanks. Obviously, nowadays we don't ride horses anymore. Uh, and I did chieftain, challenger, saladin, and ferret scout cars, which are a bit outdated now. I was a United Nations monitor. I did a tour of Cambodia. And then I finished up in the SAS. And then after that, went back to my own regiment um, as an adjutant. So, yeah, I had quite a varied military career for eight, in eight years. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that because there's a subject in, in this book about selection for the SAS. And I'm always quite interested in that. But let's kick off with sort of the, the start. I mean, interest, because you, you served in the SAS, did that mean you had access to any material for this book, which is about the founding no, of the SAS? No, I didn't. No, and actually, funny enough, I was saying to someone else, I, I didn't. I don't really know the history that well when I when I served. I think it's one of those things where uh, we all do regimental history to a level where you know the basics. So, for example, I knew who David Sir David Sterling was, knew who Jock Lewis was, knew who Paddy Main was. But this this actually this the the genesis of this book came up came about because I left the military and joined the film industry and a couple of things happened. One of which was um, 
for a brief while, there was an idea that someone was going to make a film about Paddy Main. They actually optioned one of the books. I forget which one. I think it was, might have been the Hamish Ross. I can't remember which one anyway. And they got me to consult on the script, which I looked at. And it, it, the trouble with film, we can talk about that, is they've gone quite a long way from the, the, the real narrative. And I went through it a few times. Anyway, that, that didn't happen. And the other thing that happened is I thought, well, no one's really done anything about this themselves. So I sort of started playing around with the idea of doing a film script myself which I eventually ended up with something like 170 pages of a script that wasn't working. My wife at that point said, this is a book, because I think once I got into the nitty gritty of the archive, I realised there was so much material to try and compress it into something that was going to be two hours long and a, and a, and a feature script was tough. I mean, feature scripts got to pick a very select area. And I, I'd found lots of things out about the SS that I didn't know. Uh, we, and, and a lot of people don't know, which is why I ended up writing the book. Yeah. Well, it reads very well. I mean, it reads very easily which I suppose maybe because it, it started out as a film script, I don't know, but it's such a sweeping um, story that it would be, a, I guess it would be a good TV series, but um, yeah, well, they've made one. Well, it yeah. in two hours. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a different, it'd be a different TV series to the one that's doing the rounds at the moment. No, I think, I think that when I say script, the script I was, the, the, both the Paddy main option script, the thing I was playing around were much shorter and they basically focused around the creation of L detachment, which is, which is the narrative that we all know because that is the narrative that started with Virginia Carl's uh, his book back in the 1950s, which is um, called The Phantom uh, Major. And she was a war correspondent. She covered the ground pretty well. There's some inaccuracies in that. Um, essentially, all of that's really based on something that they call the war diary now, which is a, a big, thick term. I've got one here. It's a massive block of... Uh, have you seen one here? I'll show you. No, I haven't. And if you haven't got, I don't know if this podcast will really, to give you an impression, that is the war diary. Okay, for our listeners, this is a giant, giant, giant book. book. Giant book. And the thing is, that was that was written up. That was written up because in uh, the SS was being disbanded, and in 1946 they tried to put together a narrative of what had happened. And and the the trouble the SAS had is because it wasn't a proper regiment, it didn't keep what 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 we call a war diary. So a war diary is actually a legal document you keep in a regiment, in a, in a battalion, and it's recorded daily. So, for example, when I was an adjutant in Bosnia, I had to keep one. And every day I, I fill it in. And the most bizarre thing I found was when I went to the archive, and I think I must have first gone in something like 2016, I'd never been to the archive to look out the original material. I pulled out the first folder, opened it, went, oh, wow. So in the 1990s, I used all these documents. They're exactly the same, the triplicate war diary, the signal pads, the memo forms, so, so, so all of that stuff. But that wasn't what the SAS had because it didn't have that infrastructure. It was a slightly chaotic startup um, operation. And so you have to look elsewhere, really, for the history. And I think that's one of the things about the narrative is so sort of spread out and people come at it from different angles. Yeah, yeah. We've had um, we have discussed we've had Gavin Mortimer on the podcast who, who um uh, who's written a book that really centers on Sterling and Maine. And, and the, and the great thing about your book is that it focuses on other characters that maybe um, readers aren't so familiar with um, in particular. I, I guess there are many uh, great characters throughout the book, but if there's one, it's Dudley Clark, who yes. Yes. Um, is just this hugely entertaining figure throughout. I mean, he, he is extraordinary. And, and, the, and the thing about Dudley Clark, because he was not allowed to tell his own story, because he was a writer, he was he was banned. So he, I, I said to someone, it's a bit like you know, in the seventies, the Enigma Code got de, got declassified, and so we all know who Alan Turing is and what he did, and that sort of changed the history of the Second World War, really. Because before that, you didn't know we were reading the Germans' mail. This is the same sort of thing because Clark never wrote his own story. All of these deceptions, all of these deceits, the creation of, you know, let's list what he did. He did the commandos, U.S. Rangers, SAS. I think he can take a large credit for creating the CIA because he was the inspiration behind OSS because he met Colonel Wild Bill Donovan. So extraordinary character, extraordinary. Um, and, and there's something there that I think people don't. I, I, I'm going to borrow a phrase a friend of mine used, which is military entrepreneur. Uh, you know, the creativity of these people which is not something you, you necessarily associate with the British military, particularly the British military in the 1940s, but he was a highly creative individual. And in fact, his brother, Tibby Clark, uh, became a very famous screenwriter. You know, he did um, Dixon the Dot Green, which was a TV series which became the, the template for all police procedurals. He wrote Passport to Pimlico and he won, a, won an Oscar for the Lavender Hill mob. So you know, in that family, that, that's, that was a very creative family. 
Yeah, I love those Ealing comedies. They're they're brilliant. Um, mm. and 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 Clark's career begin it begins well. He sort of brushes up with the First World War, doesn't he? And that's quite an yeah. important influence on him. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think I think when you're talking the creation of special forces, you've you've got to mention Lawrence of Arabia at some point, or Colonel Lawrence, or whatever you want to call him, because he brushes up against him. He actually meets him on an airfield. So so uh, the sort of history of Clark is that he is too young to fight in the First World War. He wants to fight desperately. He joins the Royal Artillery, but he, he can't get into the war. And, and he fears the question, you know, what did you do in the Great War, Dad? To which he's going to have to say nothing, you know, because he, he wants to get married. So he stows away with, um, unbelievably, stows away with um, replacement, casualty replacements crossing the channel, gets caught in France, sent home because he's too young. And then his next bid is to join the Royal Flying Corps, who are the, uh, you know, nascent RAF. Uh, but unfortunately, the winter of 1780 is so bad they don't do any flying training. So instead he's posted to the Middle East where the weather's better. And he gets missed by an Austrian U-boat who torpedo tries to torpedo his ship. And then he lands up in Cairo, which is a very important part of this, of this story. Because when you look at what he does in the Second World War, the fact that he's flying a, a Bristol Scout aircraft, which is slightly unreliable over the desert, and he conks out three times and crashes it, is a big influence on how he thinks about uh, coming up with the idea of the SAS, you know, airborne raiding squadron in the desert um so that's that's clark sort of the start of clark's narrative but at that moment lawrence of Arabia was always down the road he's he's landed in the red sea and he started british special forces because sponsored by um uh sir rex wingate wingate and another name you might know because he's ord wingate's uncle sometimes special forces sounds like a family business not just an entrepreneur but anyway so he's down there and he's he's basically supporting the um Arab revolt in a way that you'd probably recognize now because uh, he's providing them with training, they're providing them with weapons, machine guns, uh, they're providing them with explosives. But uh, but that strategy, Lawrence came up with himself. He, he The British really wanted him to take Medina, which is um, down the end of the Arabian Peninsula. But he thought, well, there's no point. He wakes up, he wakes up one night in a tent in a cold sweat with a fever going, you know, this is just going to be another what they what he calls wood chopping. So he describes the First World War attacks, you know, the ones in the Somme and at Gallipoli and at the Siege of Kut. He, he, he describes those as wood chopping, you know, a massive waste of uh, men uh, against machine gun emplacements. And this is going to be another. And they are going to throw the Arabs against machine guns in Medina. So he scraps that and he says, well, what we'll do, we'll, we'll strike the lines of communication. We'll strike the Hejaz Railway. And that's really influential in the Second World War because that long supply line that he hits repeatedly messes with the Turks, you know, you know, it messes them up. They have to protect it and they can't do it. Uh, and that is basically how the SAS is created in the Second World War to do the same thing, to hit the lines of communication. So you've mentioned um, Cairo and and there's a the hotel, Shepherd's Hotel, which is yes. plays a plays a key part in the, the, the story. And uh, it's got this, it's this sort of very romantic view of, of war in life during, in the Second World War in Cairo, early 1940s. There's lots of sort of cocktails and, and, and stuff like that as they're setting up the, uh, um, yeah. I guess I'm, I've, sk I've skipped ahead. We missed out the command. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, that, 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 but the truth is that the truth about Cairo is it's a party town because Egypt's not a combatant. You know, it's not. Um, they're not going to switch the lights out. There are Italians and Germans still running around Cairo. I mean, if you arrived from the um, restrictions of the blitz and blackout and you got to Cairo, you know, you can buy anything you want. <laughs> and, and, and that centres for the officers and that and the, and the officer you know, equivalent civilian ranks on. It's actually my great, great, great grandfather's hotel, Shepherds. My, my great, great, great grandfather, Samuel Shepherd, founded that hotel. And so that's still there. Uh, no, so sadly, it was sadly it was became a sort of re representative of all was bad about Britain in the Middle East, and in the 1950s it was burnt down in a riot. Um, and actually, the hotel itself was built by uh, the architect was a was a was a German. Um, he was a Bavarian. Um, and there's an interesting aside actually that that I mentioned in the book that the wings the SES now wear were borrowed because they were inscribed on the ceiling of the lobby. And if you ever read Carol Mather's book, um, oh, Where the Grass Keeps Growing, I haven't got I can't remember the title. Anyway, Carol Mather's book, he describes how he turns down David Sterling and says, I'm not going to join your unit because I don't trust you're going to produce anything, lying in on the chaise longs in my great-great-grandfather's hotel. 
And obviously that's the same spot he recruits Jock Lewis. Um, but sometimes it's a liability because eight commander, when they're about to be disbanded, go partying there and they hang out in there and they they use the notice board to tell people where they are. So the Germans just read the notice board and they know where the, what the commandos are up to. I mean, you know, you could you couldn't make it up. It also appears in the English patient, of course, the film, the film from the first one. Well, there are a few characters from the English patient that are in in your in your book. I guess yeah. the English patient is inspired by the Hungarian explorer archaeologist. Yeah, Al, oh yeah, he is Alma Zlatan. So he he is part of the story because, I mean, the 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 the, the start of the creation of modern special forces. Uh, there's there's two starts in England. There's the commandos, which is or in Britain there's the commandos created by Clark. And then in um, Cairo, it, there's a man called Ralph Bagnall, which we all know as the founder of the Long Range Desert Group. And Bagnall has been part of that desert exploring community before the war with people like Shaw and the Hungarian, uh, Almasi. And he has he realizes before the war, he bumps into in the desert uh, an Italian in the middle of nowhere, the wrong side of the Egyptian line, which is a bit fluid anyway, because where Li Libya and Egypt begin and end, in the 1930s in the middle of the desert when no one's been there is a bit dodgy anyway but at that point Mussolini is you know it, it, it is out there you know creating genocide persecuting the local people and trying to conquer the whole of North Africa and he bumps into this town unit and and the commander that unit says as a joke says you know what fun it would be to go to the Aswan Dam if we have a war I'm going to go to the Aswan Dam I'm going to blow it up and the Aswan Dam is due south of Cairo and of course that's that would have been strategically catastrophic for the British to lose the water supply so when the war starts, Bagnall keeps pitching this idea and keeps getting knocked back, which is a theme of the creation of special forces. He keeps pitching this idea and eventually ends up pitching it to General Wavell. Uh, and General Wavell sees the potential because Bagnall's idea is actually that this is just going to be an early warning force. They're going to go out into the desert, cross the Sand Sea, which is the barrier that only Bagnall knows how to cross because it's a desert exploring Bertie, though the Hungarian can also cross it. And um, but but Wavell sees more than this. He sees Bagnall. He says to Bagnall, "Well, what are you going to do if the Italians aren't coming?" He says, "Well, how about some piracy in the desert?" And he then commissions him to create the Long Range Desert Group, which, as we know, goes out strikes behind uh, then Italian lines. But 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 that wasn't Bagnall's plan. That was Wavell's plan. You know, and we can talk about deception a, a bit because essentially the Long Range Desert Group was created to deceive the Italians that we had a big capability in the desert, which we didn't have. Well, there's lo loads of deception going on, isn't there, with with Clark um, sort of dropping hints left, right and centre and, and travelling out um, to other parts of the Middle East to yeah. give the impression that there are, oh, well, there's a, is it, am I getting it wrong by saying that the SAS is invented before it actually is, in that it is so, a... Yeah, okay, so the... the the, I think we have to talk about special forces in a bit of a round here because I think mm. you have to put, the, the early commandos, the Long Range Desert Group, the SES, they're a bit interchangeable in what Clark's trying to do with all of them. Um, so he comes up with the idea of special forces, you know, special forces full stop. He has a, he has a flat on uh, Stratton Street, Mayfair, and he's working in Whitehall and Dunkirk happens and he's working for the chief in charge of the general staff is a chap called Dill, who he knows from Palestine, from the insurgency in Palestine. And he listens to Churchill's speech, you know, which is, you know, wars are not won by evacuations. Uh, and he thinks, well, what are we going to do? Because we're totally stuffed here. You know, you've got von Manstein and Rommel and Gadara in the other side of the channel, Rage of Rock. Um, you know, they get, you know, we, we're stuffed here. What are we going to do? We've got no weapons, armies and pieces. Uh, and he comes up with this idea, he calls them subliminal methods. He thinks, well, what we could do is get back across the channel with small units and just start hitting them. He calls them pinprick raids, Lawrence of Arabia, same thing he used to call them mosquito stings. And that way we will be able to dissipate uh, the, the might of the German army. We'll just keep them guessing as to what we're up to and we'll be able to hit them in their ports. And that idea, he calls the commandos because he comes from South Africa. His family come from South Africa originally. His family were in the siege of uh, Ladysmith. And of course, what we know about the commandos is they were the Boers. So after the siege of Ladysmith, uh, which is the Boer War, I'm jumping around quite a lot, so I'll just keep jumping. T slow me down. If I the listeners are experts in South Africa from, uh, we just had a chat with Saul David about the Zulu Yeah, the I, Zulu I love War. that. The Zulu War. What a, what yeah. a terrible cock up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. And obviously the film. And anyway, let's yeah. get off subject, right? So we know about the Boer War. We know about the Boer War. And the thing about the Boers was they raced off into the uh, veld. 
Uh, and rather than giving up, they formed uh, small bands of, of men, which funnily enough, hit the, hit the British. They were very mobile, hit the British, and they were again pinpricks or mosquito stings, what Lawrence of Arabia would have called rapier thrust. And so they were a sort of nascent special force. And so when Commando's thinking of a name, he thinks, I need a brand, I need a name. I'll call them Commandos, which is a bit weird because that's Britain's nemesis, but he calls them that. And the night of the Dunkirk evacuation, he pitches that to Dill, and Dill goes, Dill knows Churchill. And he goes, this is what we need, because Churchill's just taken over. And he, you know, Churchill wants the offensive spirit, he wants this. He says, can you draft that for me? He drafts it that night, gives it to him in the morning. And by lunchtime that day, so chief of general staffs meet that morning. By lunch that time that day, the commander's in business. And three weeks later, Clark is in, in a boat, an RF crash boat over the channel with a, with a commando unit. Yeah. So that's the start of special forces, really. And the, 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 there is an operation, actually. And, and I'm, I, I know I'm, um, I'm not going to be very good on, on exact dates. That's, 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 that's what you're here for. Oh, oh, brilliant. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm hopelessly dyslexic. That's good. <laughs> I've got my book to hand. Here we go. Right. We go um, well, but the, you mentioned Churchill, and this is right up Churchill Street, isn't it? But um, there's 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 a um, there's a, an operation that takes place in southern Italy that I was interested in about destroying the aqueduct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and that... Churchill's outraged when he learns that the operation went ahead. Yes, he's outraged. <laughs> One of the problems the commandos have, well, well, this is Clark's idea. One of the things Clark is doing with the commandos and then the SES is he's creating a fictional force that is bigger and more powerful than it really is. So, you know, he's got the press release ready to go uh, before the commando raid takes place. And the same in the desert with the SES. He gets the SES up on Pathé newsreels and, and, and stages it like it's a massive unit. He's, he's creating this illusion. But the problem with the press is Churchill's not in control of that. And, and particularly with the parachute drop in southern Italy, um, Churchill is worried that, that because we've demonstrated to the Italians and the Axis powers and the Germans how effective that parachute raid was, they might do it to us, which is a bit of a... I think he's just got miffed because he didn't know about it. And the, But to go back a bit, that is the creation of the SAS because, or the name of the SAS because... All these commando units are running around and Clark wants one of them to be parachute units. He knows about parachute units because he's, he's seen the Germans in Norway. He's there at the start of the war. Uh, the Germans use gliders to take out the forts ahead of the Blitzkrieg in Holland. And he knows this is... And, and then after that, the, the British and the Irish get terrified of parachuting. They, 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 it's a, something that... It's a sort of... Um, it's, it's like a bogeyman, and they start rushing around and creating lots of defences. He said, that's perfect for my subliminal methods. You know, if you want to scare the enemy, pretend you've got parachute units. So he, wants to, he turns one of the commandos, two commandos, into parachute unit, and they start parachute training up at Ringway. But what happens really is, is Churchill, you know, Churchill's sort of more, how do you say, more burlesque ambitions for the British counter-offences are far bigger than the reality. So he wants some... Um, when he hears about airborne forces, he wants an airborne tank and he wants 2,000 men. I mean, we're fast forwarding to what happens at Market, Market Garden, basically. But that's what Churchill wants. But we're talking 1940 and we, we're fighting the Battle of Britain. We just don't have the resources. And so the, the, the parachute commando unit, two commando, gets pulled out of the army, essentially. They go, look, we can't support this. It gets given to the RAF. And the one thing that's bugged the staff officers about the name commando is it's taken from the Boers. And every every force that is forces that are not regular are supposed to be called special service SS. And Clark goes, well, you now now you've got an enemy called the SS. You can't run around calling all the special forces SS because we've got the Waffen SS. It's a bit, you know, but they but they go on calling it even throughout the war. They call them special service. So with glee, the moment two commando gets pulled out of the army and sent to the RF, uh, a staff officer types up special air service. <laughs> and that's how the name the SAS comes about. So that unit gets created. And then you're right, that unit gets dropped on Italy because uh, an engineer from Holborn identifies that the uh, Pulian aqueduct, if we blow that, it might derail the Italian campaign uh, in Albania, um, which is which was a brilliant strategic target. I mean, it's what special forces are all for, you know, and they do this amazing job. Uh, they parachute in. Unfortunately, they all get captured. Um, but it terrifies Mussolini. It terrifies Mussolini. So there you go. It's a sort of the subliminal methods are all about putting this uh, subliminal fear in the mind of the enemy, which is what Clark's concept was. With the, the creation of the Special Air Service, then, of course, this is done without David Sterling. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not David Sterling. 
there are people in the unit who end up in the SAS, like a very famous chap called Tony Dean Drummond. I think he drops an arm, I'm not quite sure, but anyway, he ends up in the Malayan campaign. That's complete. We are so far ahead of that. Let's stop it. <laughs> That's, that's gone a completely different direction. Anyway, but no, there's no connection between that unit uh, and what happens in North Africa, save for the fact that Clark by then has been posted to North Africa. So he gets recruited by Wavell, same man who uh, sets Bagnold out into the desert with the long range desert group. Wavell knows Clark because he's worked with him in Palestine during the Palestinian insurgency of 1936, 1937. And so he calls, he, he's basically what Wavell's about Wavell's running the whole Middle East and he's got too much on his plate. And so he's he's a master of strategic deception and he wants to create fake units. So he calls Clark out there. He says, I need you to stop faking stuff. But the first thing he gets Clark to fake is a is, is, is actually an operation in East Africa, which goes very well. But that becomes the playbook for what Clark then does. And the second thing he does, Clark, Clark finds out by mistake that we're going to drop parachutists on southern Italy. And they're dropping right down at the heel. So that unit, could it comes from Malta, actually. The whole operation, bizarrely, is, is staged, I think, from Mildenhall to Malta to southern Italy, which is nuts in 1940. Yeah, 1941, I think it is. Um, it's nuts. It's an absolutely nuts operation. That operation lo logically would have come from the Middle East, which is much closer. So Clark goes, well, why don't we pretend that that unit came from the Middle East? So he starts pretending that we have a parachute unit called the SAS, in the Middle East. And that is the start of the deception that will eventually lead to Sterling and and and, and Lewis and Maine and, and the real SAS. Sterling, we, we've talked extensively on this on this podcast previously with with Gavin Mortimer about Sterling and Maine. So I don't want to go into too much detail. And they obviously feature heavily in the book, but there are so many other characters as well who are, who are fascinating, like Bill Fraser, J Jot Lewis, Yep. These two individuals and actually, you know, reading towards the end of your book and what they do after the war as well. I mean, I, I know I'm, it's, it sounds like I'm skipping ahead again, but they're, they're sort of made for this kind of uh, special forces work during yeah. the war. Yeah. So what I, I mean, I cover all of the all of the bases that other people have covered in terms of I think I think the thing you have to understand, and this is where I think my narrative considerably differs from everyone else's, is that. The, the concept of special forces, and it doesn't matter if you talk about the SAS and Navy SEALs, you know, SBS, whoever you talk about, is their strategic troops. So if I'm if I'm a second lieutenant and I'm in a cavalry regiment, say, I command three tanks. And if I'm an infantry battalion, I command 20 odd men. And my chain of command then works. I report to, a, you know, a major who's my company commander, squadron leader. He reports to a colonel. Uh, who's a regiment or battalion level. He reports to a brigadier. He reports to a divisional commander who's a general. And then finally, at the top of the cake, there's, there's, there's a general who's the force commander. And what Wavell set up uh, from day one when he spoke to Bagnell, so Bagnell's in his office, pitches the idea, and immediately pitches the idea, uh, Wavell says, yeah, well, you can have whatever you want. Um, and he calls in General Arthur Smith, who's his conciliary. Now, Bagnell's expecting what would happen in the army normally is you get a clerk, Clark goes, OK, come down to, you know, man, I won't use all the abbreviations, but come down to manpower. Let's find you some vehicles. Let's find you some troops. You know, that's how the army works. You, you go right back down the food chain to the bottom. Forget that. Wavell connects. Uh, he says, this man gets away and he reports to me. So that strategic connection is very important. So if you look at the SAS, for example, and the creation of it from inside the unit, the people in the unit don't really know what's going on. And that's no offence to all the great people like Sea Kings and all the others I talk about. But, you know, we have a saying in the military, which is, you know, at that level, you are you are mushrooms. You know, you're kept in the dark and fed on shit because you don't know the whole picture. But in the SAS, the officers do because they are reporting direct in to the highest force commander. And that strategic kind of role is, is set up right at the beginning with the LRDG, which then feeds into the SAS. Um, so I went off track. We're, talking, we're going to talk about phrases. No, no, that's really interesting because that, that makes it nice and clear because often it's a bit difficult to know. Is it still like that, the SAS, in that it, it sort of bypasses certain... I will... Uh, I can't... So I'm covered by the official secret, So, but I think we can establish that... Well, I've never had someone say that to me on my on the on podcast. podcast no, unfortunately, unfortunately, there were so many... Um, what do you call it? There were so many disclosures that when I got there, they, well, I actually had to sign it. They were quite, it's quite draconian. I mean, they basically Excellent. don't talk about it. But what I do, what I do think I can say is, is that historically, and I would say that you know, it, you know, it's not any any pretense that if you if you watch uh, the film, what film is it where they go after Osama bin Laden? So SEAL Team Six, you know, 
the person watching the TV is which president were we in? I've forgotten. Was it Obama? Yeah, Obama. Uh, yeah, it was a. The film is is um, is that zero dark thirty. Yeah, and so and so who who's watching when when the Iranian? I mean, this is also in a film, so I can tell you. But you know, when you're watching the Iranian embassy siege go down, it's Margaret oh, yeah. Thatcher. Who dares wins? Yeah, yeah. So the unit always reports the highest person. Now, if that's in theatre, that's the force commander, like Wavell. And if it's in uh, Britain, that would be Churchill, which is why Churchill's so pissed off about the uh, the 11 SAS raid on Italy. Though he had been told, he just missed it. Pagis may hadn't really given him enough of a heads up. I think they underestimated the strategic impact of what was going on. Well, they did. They completely missed the dropping parachutes on southern Italy. But, but part of the reason they miss it is because... Besides the parachutes and dropping sign in Italy, Clark has started the deception. And Clark's deception is, is a very detailed and clever deception uh, in the mind of Mussolini. So Mussolini has basically created all these genocides in Africa. He's persecuted the Zanussi. He's killed the Abyssinians. That's he's basically raped and murdered throughout North Africa. And so Clark thinks what would be terrifying is to pretend we're training Abyssinians. The SAS are taking Abyssinians. We're training them up. And we're going to throw them out of an air, aircraft over southern Italy, which, of course, is a bit bonkers. But this is Mussolini. And it's that, that Sun Tzu saying of, know your enemy. He knows his enemy. He knows it's this slightly paranoid, lunatic, uh, fascist dictator. This is the sort of thing that might freak him out. It does completely freak him out. It completely freaks him out. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful part of it, as you're reading about that. Um, uh, another a part that, that's interesting that may have uh, echoes today, which you're probably not allowed to speak about either, which is the, um, I guess it's called selection, isn't it? And selection for the early version of the SAS involves hurling people off moving vehicles well, to simulate parachute parachuting. Yeah, okay. I'd say that's a part of it, but that's because they don't have a parachute instructor. <laughs> that's literally because it's trial and error. So you, you they, I mean, I'll, if if you watch the footage and you can get this online, I, I, I'm, if I I'll probably find a link for you. The Pathé news footage of the reel that Clark creates that goes out as a newsreel of them parachuting, they're doing it completely wrong. So basically, because they don't have a parachute instructor, the RAF, who all the RAF have been to at that point in, mid, in the Middle East is throwing out bundles for Clark with parachutes attached to them to pretend they're a parachutist. So when Sterling... Because this is, sorry to interrupt you, but this is because speak, we spoke to Mark Urban, uh, or, or rather yeah. I spoke to Mark Urban a few months ago, uh, because it, Britain was quite late to the whole parachuting game. Yeah, I think it, I think we were we were late, but Ringway where they would yes we were late and it was a little bit trying out, but but Ringway in England they had terrible problems. I put I cover the development in my book, and actually I think Mark Urban he talks about that as well. Is I cover the early development, so the SAS leads to one para eventually, or the parachute regiment. Um, and but early on they have terrible problems because nobody knows what they're doing. They're somersaulting an aircraft, tangling up their lines. I mean, essentially going out of an aircraft with or without kit you want to get a clean exit get away from the fuselage and then the static line behind you pulls the chute out clean anything that messes with that can be potentially disastrous which david sterling experiences when he dives out as if going into water which is what the raf tend to do because they don't have a clue what they're talking about and you look at that footage they're all diving out of the aircraft and it's bonkers because i mean logically the the, the chutes attached with a line physically inside the aircraft if you dive the chances are you could tumble they call that somersaulting or spin and any of that prevents the chute deploying properly so if the chute deploys while you're spinning it does something called candle which means it literally wraps up you know and then you haven't got a proper chute or if you rip it on the fuselage which will handle sterling you, you land like a ton of whatever um and actually as you know and everyone, I think this has been covered. They, they lose two guys in training because the static line breaks, or the the, the the O ring that holds it in the aircraft breaks. So this is all erratic. So all of that is just trial and error and a bit of a mess. But that's but the bit that's crucial about what you'd now call selection is Jock Lewis, who's this amazing training officer, you know, and 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 the two people that Sterling was really after. Uh, were Jock Lewis because of his trait, and Carol Mather was the other one. Those are the two officers from Eight Commando. Both, both because were well, Jock Lewis amazing training. He'd been up in Tobruk running this little outfit, and Mather had been actually using Clark's Eureka boats, which were like early assault craft to try and get behind Rommel's lines. That hadn't worked out anyway. Cat, Mather turns him down, but Lewis joins him, and that's a bit of a game changer because I think, I, and Sterling gets a lot of flack. I, I, you know, I, I think basically what people, what I would say about that is. 
there would be no SAS without Sir David Sterling. You know, he, he had his faults. He was organizationally not good, but he was what I call a military entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. He got it going. He got in front of the right people and he sold it. And uh, and Clark backed him, I think, because when he met him, he saw this guy and went, that guy can sell stuff. And he did. He sold it to Richie, he sold it to Alkenleck. You know, he, he, he was the man. And then him and Clark exaggerated everything to make sure this unit became what it became. But no, but Lock, Jock Lewis is the selection thing was they didn't have selection, but they did have something pretty tough, which was the Lewis marches, these long marches through the desert, because because their first operation was going to be this operation where they parachute in behind lines and then they've got to navigate out. So Lewis understood, you know, not got much kit, going to be on a foot, got to navigate in the desert, might have all your team down. So it might be you on your own. All the stuff that we know from modern special forces sort of started really with Lewis and that training. I might have annoyed a uh, SAS veteran interviewing him <laughs> by <laughs> suggesting that maybe SAS selection was a little bit more relaxed than the Navy SEALs, which seems to go on for like a year or something. Interesting. Is that, you know, uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure I, the word relaxed was the well, right word to use. The Navy SEALs sit up to their naked neck in mud for eight hours. So that can teach you something, which is can I sit in the mud for eight hours up to my neck? I think. I'm going to say, oh God, I'm going to get into the row now. Um, I would say that you, what you need is you need people who can think on their feet. And the, the thinking part, and I get I get this a lot, you know, and I've got a good mate, uh, no secret, that Billy Billingham, who does the, um, he does that show, um, SAS. Oh, yeah, the reality yeah. show, SAS. Yeah. So there's, that's one aspect, which is the aspect where you've got to have people who are mentally and physically fit enough to do the job. And that's the bit that everyone focuses on. They focus on the on the sort of physical attributes and the mental resilience. But of course, if you look at what the SS has to do, and you can look at it in a second, well, they have to think. They, they're, they're out there doing a strategic job on their own. Sometimes the targets aren't even there. They've really got to think on their feet. So that whole aspect, you know, you can sit up to your neck in the mud, right? That's fine. That's one aspect. That's kind of a given. It's kind of at the base level, you've got to have people who are that fit and are that resilient. Then on top of that, you've got to have people NCOs and junior officers uh, who, and I'm saying that because they'll be the people on the ground who are capable of taking the initiative when needed and thinking on their feet. That's it. And do the officers go through the same um, test as as the... the... Oh, here we go. Official secrets. Oh, I don't oh know. you're not allowed to say. Oh. Disclosed. I mean, obviously officers get tested. No, everything's the same. I think I can say this. I think people know enough. Everything's the same. Obviously, there's an aptitude thing to be an officer, which is different obviously because you know yeah uh there would have to be wouldn't there yeah yeah but then again the ncos have that because the different oh, right i'm gonna get i'm gonna stop talking now because i'm not sure where i am with this I like, yeah 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 no i don't <laughs> want to get you in trouble yeah i think i thought that's enough on that that's enough of that let's talk about the second world war well yes and now there was one there's one individual in the book who is is quite controversial character actually eric dorman smith now oh, this yeah. is quite a niche um piece of information for the listeners so that i doubt he's 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 particularly well known but he was very famous for planning i think helping to plan what became the battle of el alamein is that yeah he has right? he has um I, I, my analogy for him would be dominic cummings they they call him the evil genius you know he worked he's hated by most of his staff right however and, and this is something i think that's important about the special forces story is is the military entrepreneurs, the creatives, and the iconoclasts absolutely vital to that story? Of course, you can't have everyone in an organization behaving like that, but you need some people who really get it, and he really gets it. So Eric Dorn Smith, the evil genius, he's kind of kept out. He is very talented, I would say, extremely talented, but he's kept out in the cold. And he is only really brought in by the Orc, General Orkenleck. But he sees the potential. He basically, when he hears about the long range desert group, he's good friends with Ernst Hemingway, who he's friends with uh, between the war. He actually, he gets shell shock. So he fights in the, I'll tell you just a brief history, because I don't think your audience will know about Eric Jordan Smith, but I think he probably deserves a lot more attention than, than he gets. So he he wins one of the first military crosses in the, in, in the First World War. He actually gets shell shock. So he gets home and his father finds him in the garden, you know, catatonic in the dark in a house they don't even live in but they used to live in and from there he gets sent to Italy to recover um, and there he meets on armistice day he's in a bar having a drink and a man who's wearing the um, Italian medal of honor though he's wearing civilian clothes next to him is having a beer 
and armistice happens and, and he says oh that's that let's have a drink and that man it's ernest hemingway and they become best friends so between the war he's part of the lost generation he goes to you know paris and he does all that and that's an extraordinary thing for an army officer of that generation if you think about all the people he will have met and hung out with and that sort of very creative world um uh, but then in the Second World War, he can't really get into the war because he's so disliked <laughs> that he shut him out. He causes so many. It, what he my, says, he, my grandfather came up against him in, at Anzio. Oh, really? Oh, tell yeah. me the story. What happened? He was um, so my grandfather. He my grandfather won two DSOs, one of which was at Anzio, and so he was a battalion commander. Oh. And his brigade commander was Dorman Smith. Yeah. And him and two of his fellow battalion commanders were trying to get Dorman Smith to leave his headquarters to come up to, to to see what was going on. And I think this is the criticism they had was that he he basically refused. He he yeah, wanted yeah, to yeah. stay back. He did. And, and I think they mutinied almost. I mean, that sounds terrible, but, um, but you could describe it as mutiny. I think they ref- they went to the divisional commander and, and stated that they had refu- they refused to serve um, with him. But yeah. I could be getting things wrong as well, but having not really researched it. I mentioned that in the book. That's very interesting. That's how they finally do him in. So obviously for a man who's fought in the First World War, has had shells to shock, sending him into the Anzio beachhead and as an older officer, he was too old for that command to give him that command was a sort of poison chalice. And I suspect, though I could never prove, that that's why they did it. Because when he was, Churchill wanted to reinstate him because Churchill saw him as talented. So he got he got fired as, as part of what's called the Cairo Purge, which is when uh, General Claude Ockenet got fired as well. So Churchill came over, you know, uh, as he said, he was going to behead the beautiful stag that was Ockenet. He was going to fire everyone. It was, it was called the Cairo Purge because they fired everyone. Rommel thought we were stupid. He said it's like it's like changing England managers every time that you don't win a game. You know, it's like well they were they were doing badly for lots of reasons, but, but you know you've just fired the entire management there. But which is what they did, and that's when then Monty comes in and things like that. Alex comes. So so at that point, Dom Smith is back out in the cold. We will talk about what happens to him before that, but back out in the cold, and it's Churchill who instates him, and he ends up in Anzio because of, of course we know Anzio is a disaster, and and he's there basically fighting trench warfare, having you know done that in the first war. It's even that type of warfare is an anathema to him because he hates that. That's what not he's about. He's, and I think we need to be clear. There's a sort of, I don't know how pe- people n- understand how much like, you need to distinguish between staff and command, which is two different things, different things in the British Army. Dorman Smith's definitely a staff officer and he's a senior officer. He has ideas. He's not someone you really want to put back in the front line, but that doesn't mean he's not a good officer. Right. That's interesting. Uh, uh, he ends up in the IRA. He does indeed. He he actually had, actually had those sympathies before because of his Irish roots. His nanny is is caught. This is the original RA, not the provisional. This is back before the war. His nanny is caught. He finds out he's, he's he's over there as part of the British Army, and he finds out his nanny has been um, helping some local um, RA members, and he shelters. He hides her. Well, he hide, what he does is he moves. The, he finds out where the cash is, and he moves the arms cash. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a very and interesting after, story. After the war, he goes back that way. But the, but the reason he's important, because he is a really an ideas man, as they say, he fires off a thousand ideas a day. Some are rubbish, some are good. But he's the one who, when when Orkinlet takes over, he he basically describes the LRDG as being like the gorillas in For Whom the Bells Toll, Tolls, which has just come out, so Hemingway's book. Um, and he sees the potential special forces, and him and uh, Claude Orkinlet are big sponsors of special forces. They get Orkinlet gets a lot of criticism later on. Um, for sponsoring Sterling. And when he gets to the Far East, he actually doesn't sponsor Wingate for that reason, because he's been had his fingers burnt by the Sterling experience. But but the but the tempting thing, and I, I mentioned this book, is that the way the Second Battle of Alamein is fought, which is fought by Montgomery, of course, was not the way that Dorman Smith uh thought it should be fought. In his appreciation, that there's something in the military called a combat appreciation, which is where you analyze your enemy, then write a plan. And, and, and that's actually just a piece of fact. He wrote that one of the options was to go round the flank at Sierra Oasis, which is what's called the indirect approach. You know, we can talk about that a bit, rather than what Monty did, which is a full frontal massacre, you know, wood chopping. What Lawrence Array would have called wood chopping, yeah. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Clark after the SAS have, are established. But he seems like a, a completely irrepressible character. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's been depicted in the TV show by um 
Mm. The TV show that's just come out by Dominic West. Yeah. Very. I, how accurate is that? I don't think it's accurate, but I love Dominic West. I thought I, I, I we probably aren't going to talk about, it, but I thought that he was. I guess I could be rude to everyone. I shouldn't say this. I might work with him, but I thought he was a brilliant character. He, I thought he really was a show stealer. Uh, you know, when he appears in there, and he appears in the dress because that's the, that is actually something that happens. And um, Clark, the picture in the book. Uh, of him in a dress. Yeah, the picture in the book. So the one, the very, this is why the, the Special Forces story is interesting because to go back to the people who are the Letrangers, the outsiders in, in any military narrative, they are the people who start it. You know, we, we mentioned Bill Fraser, he's gay. Clark's a cross dresser. You know, you couldn't say Sterling. Jock Lewis is probably the most normal of the lot, I think, in the early days. Um, but he is irre irrepressible. He has ideas and he has a very funny space in the military in that generals just know his talents and he gets called in every time there's trouble. They go, let's get Clark in, let's get Clark in. You know, Wavell does it, Alconet does it. Even Alexander, we just talked about Anzio, when the whole of the Italian campaigns bogged down because basically we've landed on the heel of Italy. And as a German, one German descendant says, if you're going to invade Italy, don't start at the bottom. It's a terrible plan. And, and so the, the winter of, uh, I think it's 43, I can't get my dates right, yeah, 43. Um, the British command are sort of struggling. Ally, everyone's fallen out with each other. You know, Monty and Patton are having rows. And they don't know what to do. And they ring Clark. So Alexander says to Clark, well, what do we do? He, fly, he flies him over there. So what do we do? And Clark comes up with the genius plan of... Um, the, the British are already going to land at Anzio. He says, well, you wouldn't do that. You'd land further north, which is Rommel's assessment. So the thing about Clark, when he comes up with these plans, they're usually better than the real plan, you know, and the enemy anticipated. So Rommel anticipates, in that case, uh, British landing up by the Po Valley, cutting Italy off at the head, and Clark dreams up a plan just further south. So when he, when he runs that deception, the Germans go, oh, of course they're going to do that, and they send all their forces north, and, and the troops at Anzio wade ashore, unopposed, and for two days, it takes two days for the Germans to react. Of course, we're not going to cover Anzio. We know that's a disaster because nothing happens. We just sit around doing nothing for two days, which is not a good idea in war. So Clark, post-war, his career, and I know I know this is um, about their history in the war, but I found him such an interesting character that I, I just want to talk a little about, bit about him post-war because it's similar to Fraser. Post-war, that they that their lives are really sort of empty, aren't they, in a way? Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the tragedy for Clark is he, he is, I, I would love maybe, I mean, I've done this, maybe we, there will be a biography, maybe there could be a film about him. I mean, he really needs to be moved up a gear, you know, for, for to tell the story. I mean, he gets a paragraph, sometimes a page, you know, in the, in the narrative of the SAS. For, 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 to tell these stories, to tell the story about Special Forces Second World War without mentioning Clark it is, you know, not an omission. It's just not a story. It's not the story. Um, but yes, after the war, he wants, he does write his first book, which, which you can buy and read, which, which is the biography, his autobiography of the first years. And that takes you up to when he gets to, um, when he gets to Cairo, essentially. So, but he doesn't really mention the SES in that. He just mentions the commandos. And in that section, he doesn't mention that mission that I write about, uh, about Ireland, because he's, he's, in fact, I found those files in the- That was fascinating. The section on Ireland is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I had a real moment. You know, sometimes you're digging in the archive, you have a moment and go, oh, my word, nobody's seen this. And those, uh, and I'll tell everyone now, all you historians out there, those files are in the Imperial War Museum, and, and they're going to have to do something like about filing them or, or digitising them because everyone should ever read. So that chapter is redacted by the censor, and they take it out because nobody can talk about the fact that we were trying to persuade Ireland to, to come into the war, and Clark had been sent there to... Um, uh, advise their army on how to how to how to defend against the German invasion. But you can imagine how different the Second World War would have been had that happened, had that mission worked, had Churchill been able to sell the idea of us deploying forces into into Ireland. You know, you, you, the Atlantic War would look completely different. You know, extraordinary. That that mission is extraordinary. That happens. That happens. That that book's published, but obviously there's lots of things in that book you can't talk about that I talk about. So you read you can read that, but then read mine, and then and then you'll see what the truth of what he's saying is. You get more detail. Um, and then he's sort of fishing around, really, because he's got all he's he knows where all the bodies are buried, you know, and other people don't. And I, I mentioned the um, Operation Mincemeat, right? So Ewan Montague goes off and he he talks about how great his operation is and he publishes his own book, goes becomes a film. It must have been incredibly frustrating for Clark to sit there going, 
yeah, that was really that that was that was the sardine when I had the shark. You know, I was I was the guy who did that, and he's got like, these other people who were essentially underlings, and and the guy he casts to play Montgomery, so he casts an actor to play Montgomery to deceive the Germans that Mont is in the Mediterranean just before the Normandy landing. And he writes a book. He writes, you know, I was Monty's double. And that happens. That comes out. So Clark's sitting there going, well, they're being drip fed part of a massive, you know, narrative that I created. And he wants to write the book and he wants to call it The Secret War. And it would have been spectacular. I know he, he's a good writer. That would have been one of the defining accounts or, or, or memoirs of the Second World War. But the sense of preventing the war office. No, no, no. We've got the Russians. You know, we've got to deal with the Cold War. This will this will be useful. But it isn't useful because what they do is they they take he does write an internal document which is called the A Four Diary, which is about four four folders worth. It's a huge document actually. It's worth it's worth going through because it has absolute gems in there. I've just skated over the surface of what he did. Uh, but they stick that in in the archive and they lose it. I mean, literally not literally lose it. It's, it's filed. But you have someone at Sanders later on in the sixties going, you know. He, he gets in touch with Clark. Is I heard you wrote a book about deception in the Second War. I'm trying to work out you know, deception in 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 Germany in, in the Cold War. He goes, and Clark goes, "There's no book. The MOD have got it all." <laughs> I think, and the Sanders guy goes, "Oh well, I'll go look for it then." So no, all this information lost. All this information lost. Um, and he tries fiction, but that doesn't really work out for him because unlike his brother, I think, and I'd say this, uh, I don't want to. You know, I, I think I can write. I, I'm, I'm big in myself. I can write. You can. Of you can. Uh, yeah. Out of the army a while. I think it's quite hard when you're in the army because the writing in the army is very terse, very abbreviated. And I think Clark just struggled because obviously when he wrote, um, uh, it's called The Golden Arrow, it was written on the back of um, Ian Fleming's first Bond book. And so I think the publisher thought, oh, well, you know, Fleming was a spy. He can, you know, he can do this. I've got Clark. He's an even bigger spy. This book's going to be brilliant. It's actually just not very good, which is a tragedy because uh, in the archive, he's obviously destroyed all record of it. All the all the offer left, everything's gone. The first book is is there with with all the memos and you know stuff from the publisher. But the second one, no, it's completely gone. Yeah, yeah, it it is it is quite sad reading about his his post war career actually. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you on also because not only have you written this this fantastic book, but you've also you're a filmmaker and. I, I'd watched your film, The Patrol, which I think came out in 2013. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, it was released 2014, but it was it was it won the Fame Film Festival 2013. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's a it's a very interesting. It's a, a, just for the listeners. It's an account of a, a, I guess, a platoon on patrol in Afghanistan during the recent the recent war in Afghanistan. So British patrol, and it's all about the psychology between. At least this is what I took from it: the psychology between officers and men, and how uh, they deal with those relationships in a really highly stressful situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a sort of. I mean, in a way, I think it could almost have been a play because yeah. I'll be really. really it real. reminded me of Journey's End, actually, while I was watching. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're on the money there. Journey's End, or the long, the short, and the tall, or one of those ones, you know. Uh, and and that was my idea was that. Because I wrote one thing, having been in the, in the business of well, I wrote for the budget. We had hardly any money. I don't know if that shows up on screen. It does sometimes? The well, summer- well, I think actually it worked. I mean, it was it was obvious. It was pretty clear to see. Yes, it's low budget, but I think that worked to the advantage because not showing the um, I'm not. I don't want to give anything away. Actually, not showing certain things allows you to see to, to your mind. Yeah. Makes yeah, it, makes but, all, but also, I think that's the truth. So I think one of the things that happened, and we, this is a much bigger discussion, but one of the things that happened in war movies uh, is, they, is they compress everything. So they put loads of stuff on the screen to make it look great. It's just rubbish. You don't see any of that. You, know, you never see anyone. You never see who's shooting at you, that's for sure. I mean, you never. Well, you do eventually, maybe, but like, no. But you <laughs> filmed it in Morocco, didn't you? Morocco, yeah. Same latitude as Afghanistan. So we're out to Morocco, just outside Marrakesh. And I got a bit lucky, actually, with that. And that's why I think it looks quite good, is, uh, though I say that myself, is that it was a Berber village. So if you know anything about the history of Morocco, actually, Morocco is in my book as well. The Rift, the Rift War is in my book. But anyway, the, the Berbers got sort of moved on and there was a deserted Berber village that we found just outside Marrakesh. Um, I, I should probably shout out to James Cutting, who died recently. He was a fixer out there. who found it. My wife and I, would, he took us out of the desert. We drove, drove around and found this place. Amazing place. Uh, and we stayed in a nearby oasis. So the shoot was brilliant. Yeah, we did it in three weeks, I believe. Yeah, three weeks shooting. And, and, and that's what we did. Yeah. The cast, how did you cast the uh, the actors? 
so they were all unknowns. I mean, Ben Wrighton, probably know you. Uh, Owen Arthur's gone on in, and he's in the modern Hobbit. I think he's one of the he's one of the Hobbits. You know, um, yeah. I mean, we just did a casting. We had a casting director. They had to be young. They didn't have any military training. But what I really noticed with the military side of it was that how fast actors, they just absorb stuff. And they got so fast with their weapon drills. And there was a point, actually, I put the shot in the film. There was a point where I was watching them on the rise and then it was getting dark. We we're filming them because we just got them to patrol around. And I thought, yeah, they do look like a kind of rough, probably quite an experienced unit, but they don't look that off. You know, they're not that far away. You know, they're doing the drills. They know how to use the weapons. They look like they're doing the job. Yeah. Actors are like that. Actors are fantastic. That's a fantastic skill actors have. They're able to absorb all that information. So obviously the Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan is, is of great interest to you. I wonder what your view was of, of the West, Britain and America's withdrawal, or America's withdrawal, and then we left as well. But um, in well, 2021... I, I mean, I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I, I mean, that's why I made the film, you know, and it's in the film. I said, well, the moment we leave, they're going to go back in. I mean, we go back and talk about, you know, troop surges back in Palestine in 1936. The trouble with troop surges is they put a lid on a pressure cooker. As soon as you take the lid off, it's gone. Um, the only realistic way to deal with insert well, there's two things about any insurgency. Let's forget Afghanistan. First of all, you have to find out what the root cause of the insurgency is and provide a, an alternative narrative to it. So if you haven't got a political solution, you, you, you're wasting your time. Secondly, you need to persuade local forces to do the job. Uh, that's it. There's no point to reporting your own. I mean, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Palestine, when we were, the British Army were over there, pouring troops into the problem is always the worst solution. Um, you might need troops, but, uh, you know, and talking about the history of the SES, we went into Amman and Dofar and trained local tribes people there, Furka, to do. And that, I'm saying that because that's public knowledge now. Um, that's ideally what you do. You, you don't want to be using your own forces. Um, and actually, we mentioned this. I said one of my favourite films is... Um, is um, Battle of Algiers, great movie, you know, which which is, they should probably sit, I mean, they should probably sit everyone down, in ba every officer down in junior, you know, whatever, Sandhurst, West Point, and make them watch that film, basically, because that's the manual. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I don't know if you've read Lawrence Friedman's um, book recently, Command, which deals with um, uh, political and, and military leaderships during during wars post World War Two, and he and he goes into Algeria in quite a lot of detail, and it's fascinating. I'll read that because that, that's such an interesting time. But that that film is, and you know, you've got a real. Um, he was in the Foreign Legion, wasn't he, Jean Martin? It was he was he was the, the guy who plays the para colonel in that was a real. And I think there were yeah there were veterans on yeah. both sides. I think in in yeah, the... and and it looks absolutely you know. But it's but it, what's great about that is that there's a moment and I'm not going to want to ruin it. Anyway. Actually, you can get it. I, I've noticed that these films are coming back now because they're putting them out through. I think Amazon's got that one. They have a classics thing going on, so you can actually just Google the Battle of Algiers and look at it. But there's a great moment when they plant the first I, what we call now IEDs bombs, and it's done by three women. This is a spoiler alert. Switch off now if you don't want me to ruin the plot. But anyway, and and there's just that scene where you go to the three women, and they're each in one's in a one's in an airline office, the other one's in a bar, and the other one's in a kind of dancing club, and they look around at all the innocent people they're about to kill because they're planting bombs, and it's a great moment. You go, those women who've got children are going through with this; they're planting the bomb, but because the story's built up so cleverly, you go, yeah, I kind of get that. And if you want to know why someone can be a suicide bomber, that's a great film to look at that kind of that the psychology of and then why you're going to lose the war. Because you're going to lose once you got to that point, that war is, you know, you're, you've gone off the rails. Yeah, the French commander is is saying this to the uh, the leadership, isn't he? He's saying, I can I can, you know, I can make tactical wins. That's that's yeah. I can do that. I can, but, I can yeah. chop off as many heads as you want and it won't yeah. solve the problem. Yeah. That is that is counterinsurgency warfare in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, the it's been so interesting hearing about the the early days of of um, special forces and and guerrilla tactics from um, from the SAS from your book it, it, and Dudley Clark is just uh, it's opened my me up to this whole life of this fascinating man. Um, but um, thank you very much for coming on. It's been no, really thank you. It's been it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Yep. If you enjoyed that and haven't listened yet, I spoke with Gavin Mortimer on the so-called founder of the SS, David Sterling. And I chatted with Gavin on the BBC TV series, SAS Rogue Heroes, recently. So I think this pod is now covered for the early years of the SAS. For now. 
Coming up, I've got an Oscar-nominated director, a chat and quiz with two 17th century experts, and I'm going to be introducing the Aspects of History Film Club with friend of the show and director Tim Hewitt. I do hope you can subscribe and rate and review if you can. Until then, thank you and good night.